Okay, so, sorry for the uh, very abrupt ending to that previous video. Unforeseen circumstances occurred. Right, okay, so, we've just been discussing the structure of cholesterol, which we have here. So, we were just discussing this group up here. So, basically, uh, off this carbon here of the steroid structure, you then have this seven carbon structure. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven carbons. And you're attached to the second carbon here. Okay? And then you have this methyl group coming off the sixth carbon. And it's all beautifully symmetric, as you can see. This one kind of fits with this one. Okay, right. Uh, so that's the structure of cholesterol. Now you do have a bit of dietary cholesterol that will just be free cholesterol, like so. But most of the cholesterol you get will be in the form of cholesterol esters. So how do we create a cholesterol ester? Well, there's only one possible way we can do this. We have one group that could be involved in forming an ester link, and it's down here. The alcohol group that was given to us because cholesterol is a sterile. Okay, so what you're going to do to create a cholesterol ester is you're going to take some long chain carboxylic acid. Okay, so I've just put some arbitrary group here, so I'll put an R. And basically you're going to link it via an ester link to this alcohol group uh, on the cholesterol molecule, like so. So you'll take the hydrogen off the alcohol group of the sterile you'll take the alcohol group off the carboxylic acid group, you'll then bind the carbon of the carboxylic acid molecule to the oxygen of the alcohol group of the cholesterol molecule, and that will create you then now what is called a cholesterol ester. Okay, right, uh, so that's what is meant by cholesterol ester. So, all of these molecules that I've just run through, uh, triacylglycerols, phosphoglycerolipids, and also cholesterol and cholesterol esters, they are all considered fats, okay? And as I said earlier, the more medical uh, name for fats is to call them lipids. And the characteristic feature that they all share, which I'll re-go over now, is that um, they are very hydrophobic structures, okay? So they've all got these long-chain carboxylic acids attached to them, all that bar uh, free cholesterol. But then if we look at the structure of free cholesterol, these rings here are all incredibly hydrophobic. So we have big, long, um, hydrophobic structures which will not interact well with water. Now, what does this actually mean? What's the functional significance of this? Well, basically, it means that the lipid molecules will all be aggregated together. So in the fluid that we are getting from the stomach, okay, which is called chyme, so if I just redraw out my little anatomy picture. So here is the esophagus. Here is the stomach here, and we're going into the duodenum. Okay, so basically, the fluid that we are getting from the stomach is called chyme. Okay, and this is going to contain all of our dietary lipid molecules. Most of them will not have been digested yet. Very little digestion of lipids occurs within the stomach. It mainly occurs in the duodenum. Okay, right, so the chyme's coming in, and basically, uh, this is a fluid, okay, so there's lots of water in there. So, these uh, fatty molecules such as cholesterol, cholesterol esters, triacylglycerols, phosphoglycerolipids, those are not going to like interacting with the water. So instead what happens is they all aggregate together, okay, and they aggregate together to form huge, great fat droplets which will be within the chyme. So in these fat droplets you'll have your triacylglycerols, okay, which I'll show here. So here is the glycerol in green, here is the long chain carboxylic acids in orange, okay. Uh, you'll have your phosphoglycerolipids, okay, so I'll just show a phosphatidate molecule with some sort of group stuck off it there, okay. So here's the phosphate group in pink, here is the um, long chain carboxylic acids in orange. Here is the glycerol molecule in green. Here is the um, top group in blue. Then you'll also have your cholesterol molecules as well and your cholesterol esters, which I will just draw the sort of steroid structure as small as I can here. Okay, so here's our 
cholesterol molecules and cholesterol esters in here as well. Okay, right, so those are all in there, and generally these phospholipids will be around the edge, you see, they have an advantage, okay, they have this phosphate group here, and this other group here, which for instance could be choline, and if we look at these phosphate groups and the choline groups, the phosphate group always has this oxygen here with a negative charge. Choline has a charge as well, it's positively charged. Those groups will interact well with water, so generally what you'll do is you'll have these molecules surrounding the outside and they will poke their polar groups out to the outside uh, and those can interact nicely with the water. Okay, so this structure is just going to be called a fat globule. Okay, and these are massive great globules of fat which are just within the chyme. So basically, if you want to do a little experiment, um, you can uh, get yourself a little beaker of water, and then you can pour some vegetable oil or something along those lines into the water, and basically the vegetable oil will generally contain a lot of long-chain uh, carboxylic acids, such as steric acid, for instance, is a major component of um, most oils. Okay, and those molecules will not interact well at all with the water, so generally what you'll find is that the fat drops to the bottom, okay, and then the water goes to the top. Okay, so, um, or have I got it the wrong way around? Actually, I think the fat generally goes to the top. The point is, they separate, basically, because they don't want to have to interact with one another. I think the fat does go to the top, actually. Um, never mind. Uh, so, basically, this is what's happening in the chyme as well. You're forming these little droplets of fat that are separate from everything else. Now, this is not helpful with regards to uh, being able to digest the... Um, lipid molecules, because basically the enzymes we're about to secrete into the lumen of the intestine, which will come from the pancreas, okay, those need to be able to get access to the fat molecules, and they are water-soluble. So basically the enzymes which are going to digest the lipid molecules, they will be in the um, water and obviously the fat molecules will be in the middle of this droplet, okay, so yes, this enzyme might be able to get to the outside of the droplet, but it's not going to be able to get up what's inside, okay, so what we need to do is split these fat droplets into tiny little droplets, so what we're going to do is split these massive fat globules into tiny little droplets to massively increase the surface area, and these tiny little droplets, the enzymes actually stand a chance of being able to get to the fats if we do that. So the first thing we need to do is basically emulsification. We need to make sure that the fat molecules are actually mixed in uh, with the water, basically. So we need to emulsify our fat, and we're going to do this by splitting it up into tiny little droplets, like so. Okay, so, basically, if we're going to massively increase the surface area of these droplets by going from one massive droplet to loads of tiny little droplets, you might ask, well, why couldn't it have just done this on its own? Because these little droplets are actually going to be surrounded by the same thing as the massive droplet was. Their architecture is basically going to be the same as the massive droplet. So if we look at these, okay, basically what you're going to have on the outside is these um, phospholipids, okay, and I'll just draw them like so, okay, so at the moment I'm just drawing phosphatidic acid, but of course you will have some phosphatidic acid molecules in, those are considered phosphoglycerolipids as well, okay, like so. So you'll have this layer of phosphoglycerolipids surrounding the outside, so this will be a monolayer basically, and then on the inside you'll have the triacylglycerols and the cholesterol esters and things like that. Okay, so this is a monolayer here. So, basically the reason you can't just split this massive fat globule into these smaller fat globules is that you don't have enough of the, um, of the um, phosphoglycerolipids, okay, 
if we're going to split it up into loads of small ones, the surface area is going to increase massively. We're going to need an absolutely huge number of phospholipids, and we simply don't have them in the dietary intake. We've got loads of triacylglycerols, loads of, well, not that much, but you've got some cholesterol and cholesterol esters. But you don't have that much um, of these phospholipids, not compared to the triacylglycerols. So you don't basically have enough uh, phospholipids. So one of the first things we're going to do is do a massive great injection from the liver of these phospholipids. So basically the liver is actually going to squirt more lipid molecules into the um, lumen of the duodenum. And the purpose of this is that they will be able to um, split this massive fat globule into loads of smaller ones. Basically, we're giving the fat the extra uh, phospholipids that it needs to be able to go from being this massive fat droplet to being these smaller fat droplets. Okay, and so... Basically, the liver is going to deliver bile into uh, the duodenum. Okay, right. So let's look at the anatomy of this. And I don't know whether to try and put it into that picture. No, I think I'll draw a separate one. So we'll start with the liver this time and draw everything else around the liver. Okay, so here is the liver. And basically, here comes the bile duct from the liver. And then you'll have the gallbladder sort of contributing part of this. And then the liver will contribute the other part. Okay, so here's the gallbladder which stores the bile. And then you'll have a direct uh, route from the actual liver itself. Okay, and then comes the bile duct. Okay, now let's add in the duodenum around this. So we'll put the duodenum here. Okay, like so. We'll put the stomach kind of here. Okay, with the esophagus here. So, this is the stomach, this is the pyloric sphincter, this is the duodenum curving round here. Okay, so let's add a bit of colour onto this after we've just completed it, I think, actually. Uh, so, we'll add in the pancreas, the other important thing now. Okay, and this is out of scale. The pancreas is much, much smaller than the liver, but in my picture it looks around the same size. Uh, never mind. Okay, and basically, uh, the bile duct is going to join on to one of the pancreatic ducts. Let me show you the anatomy of the pancreatic ducts, and we'll come back to this in a moment. Okay, so basically, you have a large duct that goes through most of the pancreas, and this is known as the main pancreatic duct. Okay, and now basically, uh, it's going to split into two. Okay, or if you like, it's going to give off a little side branch. So it's going to give off a little side branch here, and then the main thing is going to continue on down here. So this is the continuation of the main pancreatic duct. So, basically, let me colour this in. Everything I now draw in blue here, this is the main pancreatic duct. Okay? Like so. And then you've got this little sort of accessory one coming off here. Okay? And this is called the accessory pancreatic duct. Okay, so this is the accessory pancreatic duct. And basically, both the main pancreatic duct and also the accessory pancreatic duct, they are going to empty into the duodenum. Okay, so basically, they are collecting um, uh, secretions from the exocrine pancreas, which will contain a bunch of digestive enzymes which need to go uh, to the lumen of the duodenum. Uh, and uh, basically the enzymes will flow through this duct and into the lumen of the duodenum. So here in green, this is the accessory pancreatic duct. Okay, right. And basically the place where the uh, main pancreatic duct enters the duodenum is known as the major duodenal papillae. Okay, so here, where the main pancreatic duct enters the duodenum is called the major duodenal papillae, okay, or papilla rather, and uh, then the um, place where the um, accessory pancreatic duct enters the duodenum is then called the minor duodenal papilla. Okay, so minor duodenal papilla. So we've now talked about the major and minor duodenal papillae. 
All right. Okay, so basically the bile duct that is coming from the liver is going to join onto the main pancreatic duct here. And basically it goes behind the duodenum, it goes behind the pancreas, and then it joins onto the main pancreatic duct just before it empties out onto the duodenum. So let me try and show this. So in pink, this is the bile duct here. It's not a usual colour that the bile duct is denoted in, but I've already used the turquoise for the accessory pancreatic duct. And basically, uh, bile is going to come from the liver and from this gallbladder here, down the bile duct. It will empty then into the main pancreatic duct, and the main pancreatic duct will empty via the major duodenal papilla into the duodenum. Okay, so, uh, basically, what actually is within bile, okay, so what is within this secretion that the liver is producing? Well, the key thing to understand about bile is that there are no enzymes. That's a common misconception. The liver does not send enzymes within the bile. Bile does not contain enzymes, okay? Instead, it contains things that are going to help emulsify uh, the lipid molecules, basically. Now, the key thing that it contains as far as emulsifying uh, the lipid molecules from being in a massive fat globule, like so, to being in many little uh, droplets, like so, is basically it contains phosphatidylcholine. Okay, so you're going to secrete a huge amount of this molecule, uh, the structure of which we discussed uh, previously, okay, uh, called phosphatidylcholine. So we discussed the structure of phosphatidylcholine here. It's basically phosphatidic acid uh, bound to a choline molecule. Okay, now basically there is another name that people often use for phosphatidylcholine that I didn't tell you about here, but when people are talking about it present within bile, this name crops up all the time, okay? And this other name is lecithin. Okay, so people talk about lecithin all the time when they're talking about bile, and basically it's just another name for phosphatidylcholine. Okay, right. So, uh, basically, one of the major components of bile is this phosphatidylcholine, and the purpose of this phosphatidylcholine is to help split this massive great fat globule into loads of little fat droplets. Because as I say, the reason that this fat globule doesn't split into loads of little droplets is that we simply don't have enough of the phosphoglycerolipids to make up the increased surface area that you ha have within these tiny little droplets compared to the massive fat globule, okay? And therefore, what the liver's solution to this is, is provide those extra phosphoglycerolipids so that the fat globule can split into loads of little uh, fat droplets. Now, to stress this point even further, basically, um, when this massive fat globule goes into many little fat droplets, basically, the surface area is going to increase a thousandfold or thereabouts. So you're going to have to secrete a lot of uh, phosphatidylcholine basically to help um, create all these tiny little fat droplets. Okay, but it's worth it because as I say, the enzymes which are going to digest the fats just can't get access to the fats which are in the middle of this fat droplet basically. So we need to make the fat droplets much, much smaller basically. And that's the purpose of secreting all of this uh, lecithin. Okay, right, the other component of bile is that you have what are known as bile acids uh, within bile. Now, these are going to play a role later, okay, after digestion has occurred and we're trying to actually absorb the products of digestion, bile acids are going to play a role. Now, I'd just like to discuss uh, an example of a bile acid now, uh, and then uh, later we'll talk uh, more about what they actually do. Okay, right. Uh, so basically, uh, bile acids, most of them are based on a molecule called cholic acid. Okay, so let me show you the structure of cholic acid. Okay, right. So the structure of cholic acid is, again, it's a sterol. So I'll draw this here. So again, it's got these um, four carbon rings, okay? 
and three of them are going to be six-membered carbon rings, and the final then is going to be a five-membered carbon ring. So here are uh, three six-membered carbon rings, and then here we have our five-membered carbon ring here. Okay, so that's the steroid structure. And then what we want to create is a cholic acid. Okay, so basically it is a sterol, so it has an alcohol group coming off here, and then it also has methyl groups coming off here and here. It then has an alcohol group coming off here, an alcohol group coming off here, and then off this carbon up here, you then have a, a five carbon carboxylic acid group, so like so. Okay, so here is our five carbon carboxylic acid group, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, and this is the structure of cholic acid. Okay, so many of the bioacids are based on this structure. And we'll continue this discussion in the next video where we'll see an example of a bioacid which is based on this structure.